good afternoon, everyone. Thank you really so much for coming. Um, welcome to the launch uh, and webinar on protest injunctions. I'm very happy that you're here. The first thing that I want to do is to introduce Catherine Holland Casey, whom I'm delighted to introduce, who will be chairing this event. Um, I say at the beginning of my book, and it's absolutely correct to say that this manual um, could not have been written without her. Uh, she has a huge amount of experience in relation to injunctions against persons unknown, and in fact, uh, ob obtaining the first ever trespass injunction against persons unknown in the Hampshire Waste case. Uh, and these days she does loads of cases involving these types of injunctions, including in relation to high profile environmental protests, fracking, the Occupy London campaign, tree protests, employment protests, educational protests, political protests, urban exploration, the list goes on. Um, could probably spend an hour just talking about it. But most recently she's been involved in a number of protest cases in the energy sector. So without further ado, that's Catherine Holland Casey. And if I may hand over the reins to her, she will be your MC for this evening. Uh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> saying all those very kind, lovely things. Um, it's with the great pleasure that I now tell you a little bit about the speakers today. And uh, the first of those speakers is Miriam Stacey. And I'm very glad to say that we have another um, uh, King's Council in these chambers who specializes in this work. Miriam took silk in 2001 and uh, her practice covers all areas of property litigation. Uh, so far as this sort of work is concerned, uh, she's been instructed on behalf of national highways and various commercial entities, including oil companies in relation to claims for an injunction and enforcement related action. Uh, the, the range of protest cases in which she's been involved on private lands and public lands is extensive. Um, she's acted in relation to the Occupy movement, protests against the Olympics, against developers, rich doors and poor doors, anti-fracking protests, including Dutton and Persons Unknown, campaigns to promote sustainable living and student protests, and individuals against government policy, and religious protests too. Um, then Yasser is going to um, talk to us, and uh, Yasser, as some of you may have picked up already, is a specialist in both public law, human rights and property law, which uh, has made his practice a very appropriate for the protest related injunctions. Um, Yasser at a very junior age has been uh, fortunate enough to appear in the High Court and the Court of Appeal. And I've been lucky enough to lead him in the Supreme Court on one of what has been eight cases in which he's done in the Supreme Court. Um, and most recently in relation to anti-protest zones uh, outside abortion clinics, very topical. Um, he too has acted for a variety of clients in the protest context, uh, local authorities, NH Trust, energy companies, security companies, universities, park authorities. Um, I understand that in 2002 alone, he did 11 hearings on protest matters. And now he is the author of the Manual on Protest Injunctions, which it is my pleasure to be chairing on, on, on this book launch. So without further ado, I want to ask Yasser a few questions about the manual. And most particularly, Yasser, why did you decide to do it? Um, that is a good question. I think there's an overarching point, which is having done so many cases, you kind of accumulate this body of knowledge. It was not written down anywhere. There's no real book on it. Uh, which I thought could help people who are kind of in doing these kinds of cases. And I think actually there are reasons why in particular this area of law, such a resource is particularly helpful because one, you have explosion in number of cases. Um, in, in fact, I can, I can hopefully sh show you that. Hopefully, can you see my screen? Yes. So this is, this is the, the manual. In the end, there's a list of cases and you can see this is an, chronological list, right? So you see the number of cases in 2022. Now, these are all protest cases. They might not all be protest injunction cases, but they're all important to know about. And no doubt I've missed out a few, no doubt some, there are many unreported cases. But this list alone, there were 20 cases in 2022. I don't know how you're supposed to keep on top of all of that um, without a resource kind of pointing you to them. So I thought, you know, that was, that was a help for people involved in this. So, um, yes, sir, is that the reason you decided to do this as an online publication only? So you could keep it updated? I, that's exactly right. I mean, it means that you, we know there's a Supreme Court case in February on 
Barking Dagenham appeal, which will possibly have a big impact on Persons Unknown. If it was a published book, then I wouldn't be able to revise it, it'd be obsolete pretty quickly. But because it's online, you know, I, I already have a list of seven cases that I need to revise this version of, and it's just come out. So yeah, the reason to having it online is so that I can revise it, you know, a few months or when something important happens. So you've told us a little bit about the purpose of it, but can you help us in exactly who is it? To whom is it directed? To whom is it aimed? Well, it's aimed at everyone or anyone involved in these cases, both claimants and defendants. I would say it's probably directed to lawyers, but I don't see any reason why a layperson couldn't also benefit from it. Uh, but, it but mainly its purpose is to be a practical hands-on tool. Not a, you know, an, it's not an academic exploration of the, the jurisdiction. It's a hands-on tool. That's why it's called a manual. Um, trying to tell you the issues you'll face. These are the steps you have to take to give you the, the best chance of achieving your outcome. This is what the law says. This is what court might well say. So it's meant for lawyers, but other people can use it. And it's supposed to be really practical. So tell us how we access it then. Well, hopefully everyone on this call was sent a copy. I'm told it may have gone into your drunk mail, which might be an appropriate place for it. But for those that want to see updated versions or if you don't have it, let me just show you. Um, if you go on to my, can you see my profile there? Yes. You can, so if you're on my profile, you can either click on there, or if you go to publications on this tab, you'll see the most recent version. So here, version one, January, 2023, that takes you to it. So that's probably the easiest way of getting it, getting to it. So obviously you're a very busy barrister. You're aiming to update this. If I wanted to update, if someone wanted to update themselves, what they should look at it, what, every three months, do you think? <laughs> well, I think if you have a case, if, you're, if, you, if you've got a matter that you're involved in, look at that and see what the most recent version is. Um, I don't think it's something that you will just generate, you know, have a light read before you go to bed. The purpose of it is if you've got something that's on your mind because you have something you're involved in, what is the most recent legal position? If you go to the most recent, go to that page, you'll see the most recent version. And hopefully, fingers crossed, it won't be wrong or out of date. And does this mean you're always ready and willing to receive um, information that may be relevant to the, to the manual? <laughs> we, we know that these cases can take place in the county court, the high court, Queen's Bench, the Chancery Division, the Court of Appeal. 100%. Um, if, if, if there is something, if a case missing or a new case, please feel free to send me the details of it. Equally, if you think I've got something wrong or on an omission, also... <laughs> um, very happy to, to, uh, to see it. I, I have had two messages in the last few days notifying me of typos in it. And again, <laughs> that's, uh, that's very useful for me. To know. So yeah, obviously welcome to, um, I'm open to all feedback. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say about the manual before we move on to actually having two specific um, areas covered by where the talks, uh, which are relevant to chapters in the book? Is there anything else you want to tell us about the book that you think would be helpful? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. I mean, it, hopefully I've gone through, if I just quickly, hopefully I've gone through the most the set where people will be helped out with the topics I've gone through, which are the ones that kind of seem to crop up the most. You can see that in the contents pages here. But other, other than that, no, I don't have much more to say. Hopefully it'll be helpful um, in the, the weeks and months and years to come. Great. Um, Miriam, before I move on to the talks, is there anything you wanted to ask Yasser about the, the book at all? Have we covered most of it? It does. I think we've covered most of it. I mean, I'll yes. endorse it. It's a fantastic idea and everyone's going to benefit greatly from it. So thank you, Yasser, on behalf of all practitioners. Good. OK, well, without further ado, then, I'm going to pass to Miriam um, to talk a little bit about the topic of making defendants uh, parties to proceedings. Thank you for preparing this, Miriam. Thank you, Catherine. My talk is on making parties to claims. As Yasser has so rightly emphasised, one of the reasons these cases can be so tricky is that the area has been moving so fast over the past few years, and the rapid evolution of the law in this area means that practitioners need to keep a keen eye on the vast number of developments. So Yasser's manual is a very timely go-to guide for anyone practicing in this field. Uh, and for tonight's purposes, given that I only have 15 minutes, I've chosen to focus on one discrete, but I think very critical area, which has been the subject of such rapid evolution. And that is making parties to claims 
obviously a key issue. Claimants need to ensure that orders can be obtained against the right persons who can be subject to the court's jurisdiction and that those orders can be enforced and are effective. So one of the challenges in these cases, in addition to other challenges such as speed and uncertainty of what the direct action activity might consist of, is that protests and demonstrations are often large in scale with enormous numbers of protesters who are transient members of groups who fluctuate and whose identities are initially unknown. And it is against that backdrop that the Court of Appeal, um, the Court of Appeal in Canada Goose endorsed what Mr Justice Nicklin said at first instance, that private law remedies are not well suited to the task of controlling such demonstrations. Uh, perhaps the most critical tool in the uh, claimant's armory is the ability to bring and pursue claims against persons unknown, because without that ability, protest injunctions would not get off the ground. Protesters would hide behind their anonymity to insulate themselves from legal action, and the claimant's ability to protect its property rights through civil action would be frustrated. Now, although the person's unknown jurisdiction is now well recognised, with its roots tracing back to the Bloomsbury case, which involved the threatened circulation of copies of the unpublished Harry Potter and the Order of Phoenix book, the court has since developed certain guidelines which have been put into effect by successive cases in the context of protesters. And those guidelines, which I'll pull up in a moment, are in recognition of the fact that whilst injunctions against unknown persons may be necessary in appropriate cases and protest cases are a prime example, such injunctions can be draconian because their reach is difficult to assess in advance and all parties have a right to fair trial under Article 6. Um, so the case law therefore emphasises the courts should always be cautious before granting such injunctions or when considering granting them. Um, and the jurisdiction has therefore been circumscribed by various safeguards, which were helpfully set out in the Court of Appeal judgment in Canada Goose and were subsequently endorsed by the Court of Appeal in, in Dagenham. So to run through those, the first is that persons unknown are people who have not yet been identified. Secondly, if they are identified, you join and name them. If they are not identified, they must be people who are capable of being identified and served, uh, and the method must be set out in the, in the order, method of service that is. And finally, if they are described by reference to persons unknown, the description needs to be accurate. So with those general guidelines in mind, and mindful uh, as we are of how rapidly the law in this area is evolving, I have, for tonight's purposes, identified three issues which stem from those guidelines and which are likely, I forecast, for the coming year to be the subject of further clarification by the courts. So three areas. The first area relates to the requirement to name. As I just mentioned, persons unknown must be persons who have not yet been identified and in individuals who have been identified must be joined. The case law suggests that in order to bring a claim against persons unknown, also suggests that it must be impossible to name the person concerned or likely to be concerned. And that comes from the Gamel case. It's also referred to in INEOS and in the Court of Appeal in Canada Goose. On the face of it, impossibility seems a very onerous precondition. One could say that anything is possible if you throw enough time and money at it. But in practice, the position seems to be that a claimant should make reasonable efforts to identify the persons. In practice, this requirement can be a tripwire if the court takes the view that insufficient efforts have been made by the time the matter next comes to court, the injunction may be at risk. And an extreme example of that is Canada Goose um, at first instance, where Mr Justice Nicklin was critical of Canada Goose's failure to join any individual protesters by the time of securing the initial injunction and the summary judgment application. And he dismissed the summary judgment application on that basis, among other things, on the basis that it had not been impossible to name the persons unknown, bearing in mind that Canada Goose had identified up to 121 individuals and could have named 37 of them. So it can be a tripwire. 
The practical reality, this is the second bullet point, is that joinder is uh, important for um, it, it to comply with the judicial guideline that you must join identifiable persons, but also important for the purposes of enforcement. If you don't join people who are identifiable um, and should have been identified, then the practical reality of that is that they won't, will no longer be persons unknown in the technical sense, and they won't be parties who are named either. So far as enforcement is concerned, contempt applications are brought against individuals who must be served personally unless the court directs otherwise. Um, so how to identify? Given the numbers involved, claimants will generally be unable to identify individuals through their, solely through their own detective work, no matter how industrious they trawl through social media. And very often they will be reliant on the police providing details names and addresses of those who have been arrested, where, for example, breaches of orders have also given rise to criminal sanctions, such as the willful obstruction of highways. And the police will also have important and useful evidence relating to breaches in the form of body, foot, body cam footage, arrest notes, all of which is critical for claimants to enforce the orders and bring contempt proceedings. But obviously the, the ability to identify falls down without an effective mechanism or indeed a judicial willingness to grant orders for the provision of such information. Now the answer is provided by CPR 31.17.3, which contains a threshold test. And that provision provides that disclosure may be ordered where the documents are likely to support the claimant's case or adversely affect the case of the other side. That's the first criteria. Secondly, that disclosure is necessary to dispose fairly of the proceedings or to save costs. Now, obviously, the argument for police disclosure is that the identities are at the heart of the case. It's necessary for both joinder and enforcement, as I've said, and the inability to secure identities would make the trial unfair in, in terms of proving anything, uh, the identity of the persons. Up until now, the courts have been prepared to, in effect, in my experience at least, wave orders through without too much scrutiny. In SO Petroleum and Persons Unknown, Mr Justice Benethan describes a third party disclosure order as the most sensible and efficient way to deal with breaches and also pointed out that it was best that any evidence that could be used by claimants was gathered by legally regulated and democratically accountable police forces. So far as the police are concerned, they've tended to adopt a neutral and generally cooperative stance, although it has to be said that the requirement to provide information and sign off affidavits for an increasing number of protests has undeniably placed a huge burden on police forces that are already stretched. Even if the police do consent, the notes of the White Book point out that third party disclosure is the exception, not the rule. And as it is an intrusive jurisdiction, the courts has an obligation to ensure it's not used inappropriately. Recently, it's been argued on behalf of protesters that the order or such an order to provide information relating to them in connection with their arrest when they haven't been charged would offend their Article 8 right to privacy. And reliance has been placed on the recent Supreme Court case of ZXC and Bloomberg where it was said that the starting point is that such information is not to be revealed to the public. So in light of that, it's a watch this space point, there is an upcoming hearing in March of this year on the basis that a High Court judge recently took of the view that this was an area that bristled with issues and it's not enough in his view that other judges had considered it appropriate to make such orders um, without giving protests the opportunity to make submissions and that a reasoned judgment was necessary as to the extent of the jurisdiction for the benefit of all parties. So we can expect a reasoned judgment in the first half of this year, although I, I wouldn't hold myself to that timeline, but that's what can be reasonably anticipated, I think. So that's the first area. The second relates to the requirement to serve. Now, service is critical. It's what makes a party subject to the court's jurisdiction and Lord Sumption in, in the Supreme Court decision in Cameron made the point that it's a fundamental principle of justice that a person can't be subject to the jurisdiction of the court without having had notice. One of the procedural guidelines, which we referred to earlier, was that a person unknown must be capable of being served and the method of service must be set out in the order. 
And as persons unknown cannot by definition be served personally, alternative service on them is necessary. Now, as we all know, service isn't straightforward and getting it right is essential. The application for alternative service needs to be brought under CPR 6.15 and 6.27 in relation to non-claim form documents. The claimant needs to propose a form of service that's reasonably likely to bring the proceedings to the attention of the defendants. And that involves identifying a method that will bring both the fact and the terms of the, or of the order to the attention of a wide audience of unknown composition across a potentially wide area of land. It is possible to get retrospective permission to serve by alternative means, which is a useful tool in protest cases where rapid steps may need to be taken uh, and then retrospectively made good. But it, it, it's worth noting that in Canada Goose, the Court of Appeal also said that it's only in exceptional circumstances that dispensation would be justified. So you can't rely on the court's ability to dispense with service to avoid the need for service altogether. There are standard methods that are appropriate where the protest is a static, localised area of land, which, as we all know, includes signage, for example, notices with Dropbox links sending to all known and publicised email addresses. Um, and it's important to remember that the method of service which is to be set out in the order needs to cover not only existing documents, but also future documents that may need to be served in due course, so you don't have to keep running back to the court. Now, the position may prove more complicated where the process is mobile and relates to a wider area of the land. And an extreme example of that, which I've been personally involved in, is the National Highways case, which covered a vast road network, including the M25 and other roads within the strategic road network. Mr Justice Benethan in that case found that the standard types of methods were completely impracticable and that there was in fact, in his view, no practical or effective method to warn future participants about the existence of the injunction, which in effect meant that in his judgment, alternative service on persons unknown was not possible and they would all need to be identified and then served personally. Now, that restrictive approach has proved extremely unwieldy a, a practical example is where a protester who was subsequently identified having attached himself to the Dartford crossing in breach of that order was att we attempted to serve him by loud hailer um, and then he was arrested. An application for alternative service was brought in order to endorse that method, but the judge refused to deal with the application because the protester was not in court and wanted him to be brought out of prison in order to enable him to make submissions as to whether or not he should be bound. Now, as Yass has rightly pointed out in his book, that restrictive approach is not in keeping with other authorities. Um, in HS2, another vast network, if you like, the HS2 route is, was, it was very wide indeed, alternative service was considered to be appropriate. Um, in addition, finally on this, named defendants will generally need to be served with documents personally. And what that means is that all defendants who have been identified and joined as named parties pursuant to the guidelines um, will need to be served personally. In large demonstrations, that can involve serving hundreds of defendants with hundreds of pages of documents. So even if you've got the correct addresses, which is not always the case, that process is unwieldy and expensive given the potential numbers involved. Um, Another note for the future, in terms of a point of clarification to be taken, it seems to me that the question of whether personal service is appropriate in protest cases involving such large groups is one which could do with being considered at the highest judicial level and is a point that's ripe in, in, in my view for challenge. So maybe someone will take that point at some point soon. And then finally, uh, moving rapidly on to the third area, relates to the requirement to progress claims. Um, Interim orders have conventionally been recognised as, by definition, a temporary measure. It's a stepping stone towards um, the, un the final order, which is requested in the underlying claim. And case law makes it clear that interim orders are subject to temporal limits. And those limits often include standard wording such as until trial or further order, which are coupled with obligations um, enshrined in the case law on parties to ensure that um, they progress claims to make sure those limits are not academic. Now, in the last two years, there have been, as I think we probably all know, starkly diverging analysis and conclusions coming out of the Court of Appeal on the issue of 
the final injunction, whether it can be obtained against that category of persons unknown referred to as newcomers, namely persons who have not yet breached the order but may, and can't be identified, but may do so in the future. Um, so firstly, in 2020, in Canada Goose, Lord Justice Etherton, um, Lord, and the then master of the roles, Justice Richard and Lord Justice Coulson decided that claimants could only obtain interim injunctions against newcomers in protest cases, and they had to identify the individuals by name or conduct or physical description by the time of the final hearing or see the injunction discharged. Now, the reasoning was that a person doesn't become party unless they're served, as we've seen, and future protesters who don't exist, that's obviously a, a problem, or it was said to be a problem. Uh, the practical effect of that was that interim injunctions were wider in their breadth and more effective and more extensive than the final order that the court could grant. So then two years later, in a London borough of Barking and Dagenham, a differently constituted Court of Appeal refused to follow that judgment and said it was based on a misunderstanding of the underlying case law. The latest word then is that there's no legal or conceptual distinction between interim and final and no issue with obtaining a final injunction against newcomers provided proper notice of the court order can be given. So we're back to the importance of service again. Um, the mechanism for ensuring uh, that an unknown person is made a party is that they automatically become a party when they knowingly violate the injunction. So that's where we are currently. However, as Yasser alluded to earlier, the battle between those two Court of Appeal cases is to be determined in the Supreme Court in February of this year, because Barking and Dagenham is being appealed. And as a result, we can hopefully expect yet further clarification as to the reach of final injunctions so far as persons unknown is concerned, and the distinction between final and interim, possibly something on the requirements for service, and what that might mean in practice for claimants who wish to progress their claims. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Miriam. You'll, we'll uh, do questions on that subsequently. So can we now go to Yasser for your talk, please? Yes, thank you. Um, well, I'm going to be talking, I've only got 10 minutes, but I'll be talking about human rights, <laughs> which isn't a huge amount of time, but uh, I'll do what I can. I'll scratch the surface. Uh, and these are the three areas I'm going to touch. I want to just touch on the first two points and then a bit more detail on the third. But I mean, you know, as you all know, there are many ways that human rights issues feed into a protest injunction case. Think of scope of the injunction, the terms, think of enforcement, think of um, description of persons unknown. Loads of ways it can feed in human rights element, but these are just three of the major ones that I thought I'd focus on. Um, so why don't we start then with notice, section 12.2 of the Human Rights Act. Now, this is obviously the text of section 12. I'm sure none of this is new to you. 12.1 will almost always be the case in a protest and injunction case, not inevitably, but almost always in the protest and injunction case. Um, I'll come on in a moment why it might not be, but you know, the protest case involves freedom of expression, so mostly we will apply. And then section 12.2, um, in theory, applies at any stage. So whether it's the interim stage or the final stage, as long as the protester is not there and not represented. In practice, it will only be an issue in urgent cases at the interim injunction stage. Um, obviously acting as a safeguard for protesters. So you see either the applicant has taken all practical steps to notify the respondent, or there are compelling reasons why the respondent should not be notified. I want to stress that this is different to the CPR notice requirements. I'm not really going to covering the CPR notice requirements, can look at those in the manual. The important difference between these notice requirements and the CPR ones is that these are jurisdictional. This, the court simply is not allowed to grant relief if these conditions are not satisfied. The CPR notice requirements are discretionary. So normally for an application, interim application, uh, the normal rule is three days notice of a hearing has to be given to the other side. But it depends on the facts and they can be, that can be shortened um, up at the discretion of the court. So that's the important difference between these Human Rights Act notice requirements and CPR notice requirements. Now, often the scenario will be that a protest has taken place, affecting the activities of the applicant. The applicant then rushes the court quickly to stop the disruption. And what you often have is, if it is a bit, a bit urgent, 
an email might be sent to the protest group's email address saying there will be a hearing tomorrow at this place and time and here are the relevant documents, etc. And then the applicant will have to show in court at that hearing that there were no other practicable steps to notify. And this will inevitably require demonstrating that some real urgency to bring the case without a greater notice period or through more you know, common methods of notifying the other party. But sometimes there's been no notice, not even by informal methods. And in those circumstances, you can have to show compelling reasons, an applicant will. And mostly that will be a combination of urgency, but also the possibility that the respondent protester might act to frustrate the injunction being sought or to escalate the protest in some way. So that might be some one reason why uh, an applicant or how an applicant seeks to justify no notice at all. Um, an interesting question is whether those two are mutually exclusive. And it's not a straightforward answer. In the book, I detail two cases which I've been in which have taken opposite approaches. So in one case, it was argued by the applicant that they had taken all practical steps to notify, but if they hadn't, in the alternative, there were compelling reasons why they shouldn't notify. And in one high court case that was accepted, but in another high court case that was rejected and it was said that uh, the result was that the case had to be adjourned in order to give proper time to notify. And then this latter court said that if you have notified the respondent in some way, but it's deficient, for example, you said there was a hearing, but you didn't say what time it would be or where it was. Um, and so they couldn't really, protesters couldn't really have known where to go or what to do. Then you couldn't in the alternative say, there were compelling reasons not to notify because you had obviously tried and failed. Uh, so yeah, there's conflicting approaches on that point. The takeaway, I think, if you're an applicant, is make sure you pay sufficient attention to these steps, which you might not think is that important. Obviously, at this stage, you're normally in a bit of a rush, and it's very easy to focus on preparation of documents, witness statements, draft orders, uh, at the expense of important steps like this. But if you're a respondent protester and you're served with an interim injunction after the fact, um, pay close attention to whether there has been compliance with these conditions, because it could be a ground to set aside an interim injunction if you think the applicants failed to comply. So that's 12.2, very quickly went through that. And then 12.3, which is the same provision you may have noticed, but it's on a slightly different point, it's a test for interim relief. You can see the, uh, well, the classic test you put up at the top for getting interim injunction is an American cyanamid. And what an applicant will have to prove is that there is at least a serious issue to be tried. It's a deliberately low threshold, basically to hold the ring until the final trial when the issues can properly be decided. But then how do you square that with section 12.3, which says that again, not sure that many, most of you know what it says, um, no such relief to restrain publication before trial, unless likely to establish that publication should not be allowed. Um, so on the face of it, a higher threshold than the serious issue to be tried threshold. And essentially the courts have taken the approach that where section 12.3 applies, it displaces the serious issue to be tried test. So in other words, you apply the higher bar. But as you may have noticed, that wording of publication doesn't naturally fit in, the, in most protest contexts. Slow walking, attaching, sitting on land, you wouldn't normally call that publication, but some of the early cases, I think INEOS, seem to suggest it did apply to usual protest cases. And the Court of Appeal in Canada Goose, which also said that it normally cited as authority, albeit it wasn't deciding the issue, it was assuming it from the previous, from the earlier, from the case below. But these now appear to have been overtaken by those two cases, which I cite, Shell and Esso, where after full argument, those both those high courts decided that the usual protest case does not involve publication, and so Section 12.3 does not apply. And therefore, you revert to American cyanamid. Now, that's not to say that Section 12.3 will never apply in a protest context, where, for example, the applicant is seeking to restrain social media posts, production of leaflets or flyers. You can see that that may well amount to publication and so engage 12.3. And you may remember the AFSAR and Birmingham case, where that was indeed the case. That was a case involving protests by parents against the teaching of LGBT issues at primary school. And that was about banners and social media posts. So it did apply. So that's 12.3. And then proportionality. 
at the interim or final relief stage. This is central and will dictate how a court decides between the various conflicting rights and interests in play. And just what I thought I might do is, um, well, the first thing to say is that protections based on Article 10 and 11 of the Convention, that's freedom of expression and freedom of assembly, will only generally apply to public land, protests on public land. Courts have basically got to the position where on private land, the landowner's rights will almost always take priority. So we're dealing here with public land. And the second thing to say is you have to look at the nature of the activity, protest versus direct action, direct action being where you deliberately disrupt activity. And the courts have explained the difference as between trying to persuade someone versus trying to compel someone to do something. Um, and whereas the former is the core of Article 10 and 11 rights, the latter is not, is not is at the periphery and so will enjoy less weight in the analysis. Now, I can see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to try to motor through as quickly as possible. Those two references are just to note that there are some instances of direct action which do not fall within Article 10 and 11, most obviously violent protests, um, uh, violence to people or to property. That reference, the AG's reference is to the Colston statue case, where in that case it was found, not a protest injunction case, but a criminal protest case, where the Court of Appeal found that toppling the statue in that case was violent and did not enjoy the protection of Article 10 and 11. So then I just wanted to look at, sorry. Assuming you are within Article 10 and 11, that is the usual four step test you would, the court would seek to analyze to determine whether there's been a breach of our human right, Article 10 and 11. Ziegler is a classic case for that, but Ziegler wasn't a protest injunction case, but it was a protest case. And lots of the protest injunction cases have used that test. Um, I've said I've put reference there to the Attorney General's say Northern Ireland the abortion case. As Eagle was a case of the Supreme Court a couple of years ago, and there's been almost there seems to be a move in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court to try and distinguish it or move away from it. Um, because in that case it said court, a court needs to look at every single instance um, on the facts of each case, whether there has been a proportionality analysis. Um, has, to, has to undertake one on, every, on the facts of every case. But there seems to be a bit of a movement away from that. Uh, you see that in the Northern Ireland case. And that's relevant because you know, I've been involved in cases where a judge, a protest injunction case, where a judge has said, well, I'm not going to grant an injunction in relation to the highway because the police are better, a better, they're better placed to, on the facts of an individual case, determine whether someone is acting unlawfully. And a preemptive injunction isn't as good a tool for doing that. But I think we might see a move away from that because of that more recent Supreme Court case. These are then the factors that the court looks at in determining where the balance lies. Um, you can see full distillation in the manual, but here's just a very brief summary. It looks at the importance of the views. For example, in that Shell case, Mr. Justice Johnson said that the climate change protesters were motivated by matters of the greatest importance, and so presumably got some weight. But I think, I mean, I think courts don't tend to do that because they say it's not for the court to decide which views are more or less weight. I think that's probably the right approach and more, and with the more orthodox approach. You then have the importance of the location for, pro, for protesters. And you can contrast a case like National Highways, which I put there with the case of uh, Westminster and Hall. In the former, the judge didn't give much weight to insulate Britain protesters um, because their protest was aimed at the wider strategic road network. And so, that specific location wasn't particularly relevant. They didn't get much weight for it. Whereas in Westminster and Hall, which was a protest about the Iraq war, protesting outside the Houses of Parliament, that did get great weight because that was the very locus of the decision-making process. As to duration, obviously very important. I can't do better than what Mr. Justice Mayle said in that case. That was one of the tree protest cases in Sheffield, which basically said the longer it goes on for, the less likely um, a protest is going to be able to withstand a protest injunction. And then finally, the last, those last two factors, extent of the interference of the rights of others, that's obviously very important because the court, on, on the one hand, Article 10 and 11 are uh, about permitting some level of disruption. Notice being put out of joint, it's all part of it. 
important part of those rights. But uh, on the other hand, at some stage, the line will be crossed and the court will say there's too much disruption to others, whether that's to complying with their statutory duties, whether that's carrying on their business activity, living their life, huge financial loss, the more that will weigh in the balance. And then finally, has the subject of the protest been through the democratic process? Think of HS2, which went through parliament. Uh, I was involved in the protest against the cancer set, building of a cancer center, which went through the planning process and through executive approval process. Same with the tree felling programs in Sheffield and other places. If a decision has gone through rigorous consultation and a democratic process, um, courts are going to be very unlikely to refuse a protest injunction um, ultimately. All right, well, that's, uh, that's a very quick run through the human rights. I think I went slightly over my time, Catherine. I'm very sorry for that, but I will now hand it back to you. No problem at all, yes, uh, very, very interesting. And I was just thinking, actually, as you were talking, um, back to the 2004 Hampshire Waste and how what was a common law remedy invented then to give um, preemptive relief to restrain a tort um, in circumstances where you just couldn't give the names of the potential tort feasors, a very uh, inventive common law remedy, as I say, has now become such a highly regulated and technical area with so many uh, decisions recently which take very different approaches and with judges who take very different approaches. Mm. Um, and so I understand those in the audience, if you're perhaps surprised at the degree of uh, technicalities are flowing from some of the recent cases in the areas that Miriam and uh, Yasser have covered and which are, are, are dealt with in the book. Um, now, I said at the beginning that we invited any questions and uh, please feel free to send those via the question and answer tab at the top or bottom of your screen. Um, I think someone's asked about uh, how they get the, uh, the slides. And as I said earlier, uh, you'll get a link after uh, the session today is finished. But perhaps while um, some of those in, in the audience send any questions that you want to do, perhaps I'm going to put, throw out some questions for um, some discussion with the Yasser and, and Miriam. And, and one of the things that is quite a frequently asked question by clients, of course, is the question of how long can the injunction last for? Because that's a very practical point that is a concern to them. Um, so can we just have a discussion about that um, yes, sir. And the most recent cases on that. Um, mm. I think I think it's really changed over time, hasn't it? I mean, I think about 10 years ago, you would see cases where three, five years were granted kind of uh, without much issue. But in the last three, four years, you can see that it's quite rare to get an injunction that's more than you know a year, 18 months. But I also think it depends on, read a classic lawyer answer, it really depends on um, depends on kind of what stage you're at, are you at the interim stage or the final stage? And it also depends on what, what the nature of the thing you're contracting against is. So for example, if you're trying to stop protests against the construction of a cancer center and the construction is gonna take three years, then you probably mm -hmm. do have quite a good shout for a three year injunction to stop you having to come back. Whereas if it's an ongoing thing, it's just the, it's just the presence of a building is causing protesters, then it's much more difficult and it's probably unlikely to get more than 12 or 18 months. Um, whether at the interim or the final relief stage. And of course, there's sometimes that issue of when you go back to the court under your application, your permission to apply for vision, or, or what stage you go back, or how the level of evidence may vary over time. So mm. um, it can be so fact sensitive, really, can't it? Um, it's really difficult. Uh, the, when, if you, difficult. Yeah, it's really difficult. I don't know, Mary, if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It's useful in practice. If you want to go for a particular time period or a more extensive time period, it's useful to have a temporal evidential hook. So, for example, in the Insulate Britain case, they'd made some public proclamations as to the duration of their campaign, like two to three years, say. So that was a justification. So if you're going to try for a longer period, you need something substantive to, and tangible to hang that submission on. Uh, and the alternative or the fallback is obviously if you're going for a longer period to have in your back pocket an offer of a review mechanism that's embedded in which will therefore give might give the court some comfort that you're not simply going for the longest possible period without having half an eye on the obligation to supervise and keep orders under review. Exactly 
Um, I mean, one of the issues I think as well is, is that it inevitably does involve some crystal ball gazing um, because at the end of the day, um, the instructing solicitors and we as council um, can advise on the law, but we can't crystal ball gaze about how a situation may or may not develop. We simply have to put the evidence before the court and see what the judge is willing to do. And I think as um, you said, Miriam, there's obviously a great deal of caution now in relation to the grant of these injunctions, which is the very raison d'etre that we have so many restrictions placed. And uh, perhaps I could also um, seek your um, views on, on, on this issue, which is that um, I often feel when one is advising on these types of situations that a solicitors may think I'm being difficult or clients may think I'm being difficult because there are now so many um, so many steps to take before one enters into the courtroom to make sure everything is in order and one can be very, very fussy. But what these cases, particularly in the last year, demonstrate is just how you really do have to take every box before you do go into court. And it's just the nature of the nature of the law in this area now. Do you and feel like that's great of you sometimes? That's compounded by the fact that these cases are often brought extremely rapidly. It's not only you ticking many multiple boxes, but you're ticking multiple boxes at breakneck speed. Yeah. And I to that, judges, it's almost you know, I, would, I used to watch Suits, and one of the fun things about watching Suits is that you get one of the comedy aspects is how different judges are and how their personalities are. And by and large, it's, you know, it's caricature. But genuinely, in this area of law, different judges make a huge impact on the outcome and what they want and what they're specifically concerned about. So sometimes you just don't know until you see the name on the cause list or you get into and, court and, 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 in front of you. And that's why we're getting some inconsistent decisions. And the judiciary are hearing these in urgent situations will subjectively have different answers to some of the questions that we have to pose to them. Um, yeah, yeah, very much so. Now, I'm very happy to say we've got lots of questions coming in. And uh, one of them um, is the question of which court one should issue proceedings in and whether there are any benefits or advantages um, in relation to the bringing of injunction proceedings in the High Court as opposed to the county court. And I've got various views on this, but perhaps I'll go to Miriam first to see if you have any views on that. Well, I think it very much depends on the county court that you're thinking. I would automatically go to the high court um, simply because oh, it, it, you're, you, you're more likely to be able to get certainty um, in terms of getting a slot quite quickly. The high court is pretty good, frankly, at getting these injunctions listed. Uh, rapidly and understanding um, and having seen a body of um, similar types of applications coming before them. So in, in that sense that there's more of a familiarity, I suspect, in the High Court than there would be in a county court. Um, and I know that Yasser, in your book, you, you've dealt with this in one of your sections about the various procedural requirements that differ between the King's Bench Division and the, and the, um, and the Chancery Division in terms of timings and such like, but I don't know whether specifically you did deal with the, the county court. No, I didn't. I have a bit at the beginning where I say, I'm, I just deal with high, I just, I'm just yeah. dealing with the high court, because I didn't have yeah. any experience with the county court. And I, I um, uh, in protest and junction cases, I suspect that. Um, well, the types of cases, if we're dealing, if you're instructed on behalf of an oil company or on behalf of a, you know, public authority that's concerned about, you know, disruptive direct action protests uh, on air and the need for protection, which might involve in you know, the police getting involved, then you can justify issuing it in, in the High Court in, in those types of cases. I mean, I, I, I suppose the, um, the scenario for the three of us is that we tend to get instructed on quite substantial matters, mm. but I suppose we shouldn't leave out of account the fact that um, in relation to possession claims, the statutory restrictions when you can bring proceedings in the High Court, and often injunction claims are combined with possession claims, um, such as a very serious issue for consideration, whether one can actually justify under the statutory restriction bringing the possession proceedings in the High Court. And that is a particular case where you will be obliged to go in, in the County Court um, or ordinarily. A added to which I suppose, in the uh, bigger courts, such as Manchester and Leeds, um, the county court there is obviously very accessible. And um, so I think it's a very sensible question that's been asked. I think it's one that has to be answered on every case and shouldn't be overlooked. Um, so uh, one of the other questions we've had is the question of the spatial restrictions in relation to the boundaries 
uh, regarding the grant of injunctions and what limits the courts tend to put um, in relation to those boundaries on the injunction. Yasser, do you want to deal with this one? Yeah, it's, I mean, I think courts are more concerned about the geographical limits on the injunction being precise. They have shown in the last year or so to be happy to do very wide injunctions. For example, the whole of HS2, the whole of the strategic road network. Those obviously cover huge areas, but they were deemed necessary because of the level of threat. And something that they've set, say, for example, you've had three or four protests on specific parts of HS2. It could be argued, well, you mm -hmm. limit the protest, the injunctions to those areas and not to the whole thing. But the courts have said, well, that's just um, a recipe for, I think they use the phrase, literally guerrilla tactics, because then you just protesters might pop up somewhere else. So they have generally been, as long as the evidence can be shown that it's relatively widespread, to grant injunctions over pretty wide areas, um, as long as they're precise. That's one thing they've been more concerned about. Um, Miriam, I don't know if you want to say anything. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, it has been, again, this is an area where there's been a substantial evolution over a very short period of time, a couple of years ago. There was there was more. It seemed there was more of a cautious approach in terms of identifying whether the risk on the evidence justified granting an injunction over a wide degree of a graphical area. Um, and as you say, yes, yeah, and so now it seems that the focus has shifted more to the clarity of the order, um, and there has been a greater um, willingness to extend the ambits of the geographical area. But you know, HS2 and Insulate Britain, they're pretty unique in the, yeah. in the nature and scale of. The yeah. activity so it could just be that those unique situations call for pretty wide measures and it may not be the case in other cases no i mean you're always going to need to justify on the evidence yeah. you know the order over the geographic area you're seeking clearly i'm conscious that we haven't um dealt too much with enforcement issues and middle and there's a couple of questions on this i think uh, interesting questions Marin, that you might want to um to deal with in relation to this. Um, but perhaps first of all, let's just say a little bit about it, 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 it generally about the criminal sanctions in relation to committals and indeed powers of arrest in relation to um, an injunction. Do you want to just um, talk about that a little bit, Miriam? Yeah, um, so it's a hybrid um, it's, I, I, it idea, uh, if you like. The committal process um, involves the burden of proof which is the criminal standard beyond reasonable doubt but it doesn't give rise to a criminal offence the breach of a civil injunction doesn't give rise to a criminal offence but you do have to prove as a claimant uh, because of the potential severity of the penalties um, that um, criminal standard of, of proof and assuming a breach is proven then a finding of civil contempt will be made out um, so a person who commits that doesn't acquire a criminal record um, and civil contempt is not of itself a, a crime, which is punishable by a court. Um, in terms of the power of arrest and, and its application to injunctions generally, parties can't automatically, generally parties can't automatically attach or ask the court to attach a power of arrest to injunctions. There are certain types of parties who have that ability. Um, uh, pursuant to statutes, so public authorities, local authorities, um, there are certain statutes which empower the court to attach a power of arrest to injunctions in, in relation to applications by those types of applicants. So, for example, uh, Section 27 of the Police and Justice Act 2006 applies to proceedings in which a local authority is a party um, and by virtue of Section 222 of the Local Government Act, which basically gives local authorities the ability to bring proceedings to promote the interests in their particular area. So if you're a local authority client bringing such an application, you can then ask the court to attach a power of arrest. And an example of that recently or last year, may have last year, I think it was, the um, Warwickshire, North Warwickshire Bor Borough Council obtained such an injunction at the same time as all companies obtaining injunctions over similar areas and the benefit to everyone was that that power of arrest enabled the police to galvanize and to arrest large bodies of people much more quickly um, than an ordinary injunction would have. And, and one of the questions we've been asked Marin, relates to the uh, outcome of committal proceedings and the prospects of um, a successful um, committal claim. Um, do you want to talk about that for a few moments? I think that might be quite helpful for the audience. 
yeah is that one for me or for yasa i think that's probably one for you again if, if you don't mind yes not at all, not at all. Um, so in terms of outcome i mean two there are two stages to to a contempt application essentially the first stage is as i've said the criminal standard of proof you have to prove the breach and it, 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 it's that what that requires you to do is to establish that um, the, the, the criteria that was set down in the Curian case, namely that there has been a, a breach um, by a defendant who had notice of uh, the order. And notice in this context doesn't mean actual notice, it means um, presumed notice. So if there's an effective service mechanism, then that's sufficient for the purposes of notice. So there was a breach of which the, and the defendant had notice and intended to, to breach, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what you need to prove. Uh, and once a finding of uh, a liability has been established, um, and I should say you also have to tick all the procedural boxes, which are complex and extensive. So, but if you get past liability proving the breach and past the procedural hurdles, you move on to sanction and that's stage two. Uh, and sanction is essentially a matter for the court. It, it's the court that decides um, what sanction to lay down. Um, but there are certain uh, uh, guidelines which are helpfully uh, provided by way of a somewhat of a checklist in the National Highways and Haya Tarwin case. Uh, there's, there's a helpful couple of paragraphs in there, which actually is a useful cut and paste in terms of the approach that the courts uh, tend to take. There may be other cases since then who that have adopted and kind of expanded those criteria, but that's a starting point at least. Thank you, Miriam. For, forgive me for cutting you short there, but I just want, we've only got a very short period of time left and um, so that Yasa just has a chance to come in on this issue. Um, Yasa, one of the uh, questions that arises very often in relation to this is, um, to what extent are you in breach of the injunction if you don't actually know about it? And that's a question which very often crops up in relation to that phase of, of the matter. Uh, we've only got one less, minute, less than one minute, but perhaps you can just cover that point. Well, I'll say I'll make two points. One is technically the fact that someone doesn't actually know the injunction is not relevant to whether they are in breach of the injunction. As Miriam just said, Court for Appeal Authority from last year, um, that says all that needs to be done is the service requirements need to be carried out. And once, once they've been carried out, it doesn't matter that you don't know about it. If you don't do something that's not allowed, that's in breach. And in fact, you do have contrasting cases. <laughs> we haven't seemed to read earlier more authoritative cases about this, seem to get it wrong, but that is the position. The second point is this, even if someone is in breach, that doesn't mean you should necessarily, if you're on the applicant, bring contempt proceedings against them. If, for example, they didn't know about it, and it's a very trivial breach, think very carefully before you bring contempt proceedings. A recent case from a few months ago, I think it's MBR Estates, where a case was brought against someone who probably didn't know about it and committed a very trivial breach, and the court came down very hard on the applicant, saying, yes, there may, even if there was a trivial breach, probably didn't deserve bringing committal applications. So, and it will only, it will go to sentence, even if you commit a trivial breach, not knowing about the injunction, the sentence will be barely anything. If, so that, that's two, two points to make about that. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for dealing with that quickly. Now, it, it, it leaves me to say three thank yous. First of all, thank you very, very much to the audience. Um, it's been uh, lovely to see such uh, a, a, an array of familiar names on our attendance list. So thank you very much for listening and for watching uh, today. My second thank you is to Miriam for all her input in relation to this. And the final thank you must obviously go to Yasser, um, without whom we wouldn't be here on this. Episode. Many, many congratulations on writing this manual. Thank you very much for doing so. And uh, thank you for all your contribution today. And, and with that, I will say goodbye to everybody. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine.